Okay, let us talk about Ted Bundy. Do you know anything about Ted Bundy before we begin? I don't really know much about Ted. He was born in Vermont in 1946. So he had a bit of a tumultuous upbringing. Ted was brought up by his grandma, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking that his grandma was his actual mum and his actual mum, he thought was his sister. Great, so we're starting off at a terrible place. And he goes to college. He goes to, he finishes high school, goes to college and he meets a woman. This woman, her name was Diane Edwards. He loves Diane. Diane is his number one boo. Like he loves First her. love. First love. He's fallen in, he's deep. And they date for a while and you know, they're living it up. But at one point, Diane doesn't think that Ted is ambitious enough for her. So she breaks up with him. So she breaks up with him. He's not ambitious enough. She yeah. wants like a certain lifestyle. Exactly. He's not cutting the mustard. He does not take this well. To put this lightly, he is devastated. He is unhappy. He is not okay with the whole breakup. Yeah. Uh, but that's okay. You know, you know, things happen, you know, he breaks up, whatever. So he moves on and he meets another woman. Great. He meets one other woman called Elizabeth. So she was a single mother and had a child and they met at a bar and he supposedly fell in love with her at first sight. Okay. And he was very willing to look after her and look after her child. I think she was very wary, of course, in that time. There was like a huge stigma around uh, single mothers and where the fathers were. So he finishes college degree as sure. a psychology major. Okay, uh, yeah. Interesting point. Yeah. Uh, and he worked for the Republican Party at one point, the local Republican Party, um, and was accepted into law school. So he starts doing quite well for himself. So he's in California and guess who he bumps into? Who does he bump into? He bumps into his old flame, his old lover, who broke his heart, Diane. They bump into each other and she goes, my God, he's so put together, he's so mature and- He's so ambitious. So ambitious, yeah. so ambitious. I'm falling in love with him all over again. So they start dating again and it, she's obsessed with him. And suddenly he just cut off all contact with her. So he's in California, just stops talking to her, stops replying to her, ghosts her. So at one point, I think it's maybe a year later, she finally gets back through to him and she goes, what happened? A year? Oh, a year passes. This is kind of, you know, a year passes. And she goes, what happened? And apparently the words that he then spoke to her chilled her to her core. He went, Diane, I have no idea what you mean. And then hung up. He'd just been petty. She'd broken up with him. He moves on, gets back together with her, only to break up with her and do what she did to him back to her. I think that's beyond petty. Bearing in mind, at this point, he is still dating Elizabeth. Oh. We then move on to the first attack, if you will. The first kind of incident where he is assaulting women. 4th of January, 1974. This is interesting. So this is his first attack, but she survives. Mm. So he sneaks into... Uh, a house where there is a young woman sleeping and he bludgeons her with a metal rod that has been taken from her bed frame. He then, uh, a month later, commits his first kill, essentially. Right. He breaks into a basement apartment uh, and finds Linda Ann Healy. So that is the name of his first ever victim who dies from right. the attacks. So he beats her unconscious and she's in a nightgown, which is completely covered in blood, completely covered in blood. So he takes her out of that and puts her in other clothes from her wardrobe and puts that in her wardrobe, right? So it looks like, you know, nothing's really happened, uh, which I think investigators later thought when they saw it, oh, she just like had a nosebleed because it was hung up. So they thought, oh, that's a bit crazy. Is that going to be the first sign of just terrible police work? <laughs> the, 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 the yeah. I imagine is going to continue throughout this. What a huge nosebleed. Yeah. He then starts taking and assaulting and killing a lot of students. So right. A lot of female students from the University of Washington. And they all start disappearing from their dormitories. Which and I, so I don't know much, but I feel like, didn't they all look really similar? Isn't that a thing? Yeah. So what's really interesting about how they looked is they all had, they were all very pretty. They had long, dark hair parted down the middle, most of them. Mm. Uh, and you know who else had long, dark hair parted down the middle? I think I can guess. His uh, ex-girlfriend who broke his heart, Diane. Oh, of course it was Diane. So the only clue that they have at this point is that someone had seen one of the women or had seen a man 
with a Volkswagen Beetle or bug, uh, like a, a tan coloured bug, mm -hmm. uh, and a guy carrying a load of books, wearing a sling, asking for help to carry the books to his car. So he was essentially preying on people's kindness. Yeah. In June, uh, he knocks another student unconscious, drags her away and murders her. And her name is Georgian Hawkins. Now he handcuffed her and I think he strangled her and then spent the entire night with her body. So you can only imagine what was going on sure. in those nights. So the next morning he did realize that he had, I think left something behind. I know about this. Right? Yeah. So he left something behind and I think we can assume that Ted Bundy was a very egotistical man who thought a lot of himself and, a, and I don't know if narcissistic is specifically the right word, but elements of that, because he went back to that scene of the crime. He went back to where she was whilst there were police officers there, whilst there were detectives at the scene yeah. of the crime investigating. He went back, figured a way to sneak past them and located her earrings and one of her shoes and took them without being spotted. Why did he take, oh, did he take them because he thought that like some of his DNA was gonna be on them or something? I don't know, but I do know that he did have rituals Rituals when he killed women. He would uh, take Polaroids of their bodies. He would take certain um, pieces of clothing. So there were a lot of pantyhose that he would take, clothing from women that at one point, I think Elizabeth, his uh, girlfriend with the kid found and became very suspicious of, but he would take like little mementos of each of the women. So I think, I wonder whether that's what that was. Like a trophy thing. He would also, I think sometimes shampoo the hair of the girls that he'd killed post killing them and put makeup on them to make them look a little bit more presentable. Oh my God. I know, yeah. really quite weird. So he essentially becomes a little bit more bold in the way in which he's taking these women. He's getting carried uh, away, I can feel it. So this, is essentially where he makes a big mistake. So he goes to Lake Sammamish and it's really crowded and really busy and it's in broad daylight. And I can't remember how many people were there. There were a lot, lot of people there, mm. like tens of thousands of people there. Um, and he does the sling, he gets his arm in a sling and he goes around asking people whether they would help him put a sailboat into the back of his van. Okay. And he can't do it because he's in a sling, but two women say yes. Now, their remains were found later, these two women. So he abducted them and killed them and did what not to their bodies. But the issue is, and this is the mistake he made, he, there were witnesses. So there were people who heard him introducing himself to these girls. Because with he was, his name? With his real name. At that point, there were so many eyewitnesses, the police were able to come up with a sketch. A little Okay, the yeah. first bit of evidence. The first bit of evidence as to what this guy looked like, so they knew his name was Ted, and they knew that he looked like that. And guess who recognizes the sketch? Um, is it uh, his girlfriend? Which one? <laughs> the one with the kid? Yes. Yes. So Elizabeth Klopfer, Liz, she calls the police, she goes, listen, my boyfriend, a bit weird, but he looks like the drawing and he's called Ted and he drives that car. So I just thought I'd like give you that information. It's called Ted Bundy. So they have this massive database of people and at this point, Ted is like a really clean cut law student. So it's kind of unlikely that right. they, they're gonna be like, oh, well, it's this guy, yeah. but they put his name down and they just have it on file on the database, just in case. Um, anyway, so at this point, Ted still hasn't been caught and he's living his free life and he's accepted into a university in Utah. So he's in, he's in he moves to Salt Lake City because he's at the university there and he leaves Elizabeth with her kid in Seattle. Okay. So interestingly, the deaths in Seattle stop. As soon as he arrives, he starts killing people again. Right. There was a hitchhiker that he strangled, a 16 year old who has never been found. And then he abducted uh, the police chief's daughter and killed her. And her body is found kind of nine days later, uh, completely naked in the mountains. And it's said that she may have been alive up to seven days after her disappearance. Right. So quite traumatizing, mm -hmm. I would argue. So I missed out a mistake. He makes three big mistakes. Okay, so the okay. first one was abducting in pure daylight and using his real name. Yep. This is his second mistake. So he now, there's another survivor. So he poses as a police officer and approaches Carol Deronch. And he approaches her and says, I'm a police officer, someone's tried to break into your car come check it out with me. And she goes, well, that's a bit weird. Like why, is, you know, this, this feels bizarre. Why are you in normal clothes? Like what's going on? And she goes, well, I'm not getting in a car like with you. W mm. Where's your badge? So he shows her the badge. So she's questioned him and she's gone, and he's gone, here's my badge. And she goes, okay, I'm embarrassed, sorry. Follows him to the car, uh, gets in the car. They're driving around and she goes, bit weird how his police cars are 
Volkswagen. Like, that's a bit mm. weird. Anyway, he takes a wrong turn. She questions it. He suddenly launches over, puts handcuffs on her and says something along the lines of, I'm going to blow your head off. So that's what she can remember. So that's important. Anyway, at one point, there's a bit of a scuffle and she manages to escape. So she escapes and she runs away and she jumps into a car, hysterical crying and just says, just a car that was approaching, it just goes, drive me to the police station. So she drives to the police station and, um, and reports what has happened. At this point, there's been disappearances in Salt Lake and Elizabeth with the kid. Yeah. His girlfriend calls up the police. She's like, listen, something is going on. Like there's been disappearances in Salt Lake. I'm calling you again because my boyfriend has now moved there and there's disappearances. Like something needs to happen. He then gets arrested. Okay. But he gets arrested for driving too fast. So a literal, a routine traffic incident. He's just speeding. Unrelated. Unrelated and he gets pulled up. So they take him into the police station and they see in his car that he's got, that he's got handcuffs, an ice pick, crowbar, rope, and also he had a ski mask. As items for serial killers go, yeah. I would say high up there. Ski mask, definitely cherry on the cake. They arrest him and while the guy's arresting him, he's like, there's weird things in his car. They flag it up. They search his house. They flew out Elizabeth to be interviewed. Uh, and at, th at that point she was quizzed on the things that she'd found in her home. We're getting somewhere. There is a lot of evidence now yeah. against Ted, but not enough to convict him. Okay. Not enough, but, they, but they're very suspicious. Mm. So what they do, Carol Deronch, the girl that got away from him in the car when he posed to be a police officer. Yes. They call in a selection of people for a lineup and they bring Carol in for, and this is for aggravated kidnapping. They bring Carol in and they go literally, which one is it? Like who did it? You know, the classic lineups. Yeah. Who Even is suspects. it? And so they all stand forward and they go, I'm going to blow your head off. And they all use that line because that's what he said to her. Anyway, so he tried to get out, away from it. So he like switched his parting. He shaved his mustache. So he like wouldn't be recognizable. Didn't work. Carol goes, that's him. That's the guy that tried to kidnap me and picks him out of the crowd. So never good. He is then uh, found guilty and he is charged with kidnapping and assault. So he's sentenced to up to 15 years. Uh, in prison. When he's in prison, they keep investigating him. And then later that year, he's charged with one of the murders of the girl, like one of them. I'm not sure which girl it was, but he's charged with a murder. Okay. So okay. for that, he then decides to represent himself in court. Big ego, yep. loves himself. He's like, I'm a law student. I know all of this information. Letting his ego just blind him. This is where it gets a bit interesting. So because he was choosing to represent himself, he was able to convince the judge that he should be allowed to use like the law library and use all of these resources available to lawyers to help his own case, which makes sense. So while he was doing that, someone wasn't looking. So he's in there. He's not got any shackles on. He's able to use all the books and there's an open window, second floor open window and he jumps out, injures his foot and he runs away. Sorry, is this a cartoon? <laughs> That's how he escaped from prison. Oh yeah, just jumped out the window. I know. He was on the run for almost a week, but he was cold and tired and sleep deprived and delirious and in pain and ultimately ended up back in the back in the district, okay. picked up by police and put back in a prison cell. And he's in jail. He's planning his second escape. They've locked all the windows. They've locked all the windows. They feel great about it. Exactly. And he's planning his second escape. So he acquired like a floor plan of everything. He got a hacksaw. And when the prison is showered... I'm sorry, I need to pause. Yeah. He got a hacksaw. Okay, so... He's in jail. <laughs> so valid, valid query. When he was doing odd jobs around the jail, he would pick up things here and there, pop it in a sock. Yeah. But he would acquire lots of things. And when... Uh, all the prisoners were showering because there was a lot of noise going on around. He would use that time to saw a little hole in the ceiling. So it is a cartoon. Thank you for clarifying that. So it was at Christmas time. He escaped. He gets out through the hole. And this is like the kind of, this is his biggest spree, his biggest killing spree at this point, And also how he ends up getting caught as well. So, so he escapes and then, and then he's out for how long? They don't clock that he's gone until 70. He has a 17 hour head start. So he ended up in Florida, rough choice because big on the death penalty there, but mm. ended up in Florida and it was, so it just went on a massive killing spree. So the biggest one he did, he went to this Kai Omega house, which was a sorority house mm. in Florida at the University of Florida, I believe. And he entered the house at 2 a.m. and attacked the students as they slept. For this attack, oh, he what? killed two women and injured two. One, I think he sexually assaulted so badly her spleen ruptured. 
it was just dreadful and he yeah. killed two others. So there were four injured women and it was just the worst. Yeah. Then he did his final murder. The victim was 12. Oh. So she was leaving her school and he abducted and killed her and her remains were found later mummified at a pig farm. Mm. And that one, her name was Kimberly Leach. And yeah, that was a bit of a kicker because I think she was so young. And actually he refused to talk about her death when he was being questioned and when he confessed, he refused to talk about her because she was so young. So he's driving away, he's killed this 12 year old girl, he's killed all these people, he's on the run from the police and he's in a car. He's in a stolen car and the police flag it up. He is obviously like, fuck, because he's on the run from police. The last mm. thing he wants to be done is pulled over for, anyway, so they- Shouldn't have stolen the car. Anyway, sorry, go on. Bit of a scuffle with the police officer and they arrest him and take him in, right? So at this point, uh, they have a trial. Right, so that, that's when his trial starts because at this point the police are like, well, you are very clearly very guilty. So the jury found him guilty. We got some. Uh, they found him guilty for two murders, three counts of attempted murder and two counts of burglary. And do we know which specific counts they are or are they just, it's one of the many that one he's- One of the many yeah, because okay. he didn't confess to any of them. Right. Until the day before he died. And Oh, okay, cool. So he was, for those murders, sentenced to death. Six months later, he was then charged with Kimberly Leach, the 12 year old's murder as well. I believe it was nine years after he was sentenced to death that the execution date was set. So it was in right. like nine years he spent trying to appeal this. Right. And of course he did. He was in that he was constantly trying to appeal everything to buy himself more time, constantly trying to buy himself more time so he could get out of it. It was the day before he was set to be executed. He finally confessed up until that day nine years he was vehemently just like i did not do it until the day before he was like fuck it yeah this is what i did it's over but he only confessed to 30 and there were more than 30 only 20 of those victims were ever identified and he didn't want to talk about a couple of them he was finally executed at 7 16 uh, on january the 24th 1989 one thing that I would love to know is what he got for his death row meal. So Ted was given the standard breakfast meal uh, on Florida's death row, which was steak done medium rare, eggs over easy, toast with butter and jelly or jam, that's what we call it, milk, coffee, juice and hash browns. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> Tasty. Wow. So this is what he had. Oh, but I wouldn't go for any of it because Ted actually declined a meal in the first place. So this is just the standard meal they give every prisoner who doesn't ask for anything. And then when they gave him the dish, he ate none of it. So he actually died on an empty stomach. I remember the first week my charge nurse said, can you go up to the toilets there and just check on that patient? And I went up and the next minute he had me by the neck and he was trying to strangle me and it was fight or flight.